Good morning, lovely people, and welcome to the Nave. It is indeed a privilege, a pleasure and a joy to welcome you to our service today. And whether you are watching with us live on a Sunday or at another time, or you are joining us from any part of the world, we welcome you all as one in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It is so wonderful that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord in this way and we do give thanks to God for the technology that allows that to happen. But did you know that the nave isn't the only online service that we have going on in our online church? There are lots of things going on and lots of things that will be starting as the weeks and the months go ahead. And if you'd like more information on any of them, please feel free to send us an email or office at stmikes.net for more information or even to sign up for our new sheet. Did you know that this week we have Morning Prayer on Facebook at 9.15 a.m. and a service of Holy Communion on Zoom on Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. And everyone, and I mean everyone, is welcome to join in with those. And again, if you want more information, please just send us an email. But turn into our service today, and we have so many things that are going on. We are gonna be spending a time in praise and worship to our Lord and King. We're gonna be hearing from God's word as we continue in our series of Acts, in this year of Acts, in the LMA of Aberystwyth. And Liz is gonna be speaking to us on the theme of connecting with culture as Paul in the book of Acts speaks in Athens. But more than any of that, we get the opportunity to meet and worship and be in the presence of God. So let's lift ourselves to him this day. Father God, we give thanks that we can worship your name. We give thanks that your love is beyond measure and we come now to offer you our praise. Fill us with your Holy Spirit where we are and we lift ourselves to you. Bless us in your holy name. Amen. Let us worship the Lord.
of the things that we get the opportunity to do when we come to worship is to put ourselves right before the Lord. We come to confess our sins and we do so safe in the knowledge that Jesus has died for us and he has risen again and that when we are truly sorry, he forgives us. So I wonder where you are right now, if you would like to spend a few moments in silence, asking the Lord to call those things to mind which we all need to say sorry for as we seek his forgiveness. Father God, we are sorry that we have sinned in thought, in word and in deed, and that we have not done those things which we ought to have done. In your mercy, we ask you to forgive us. Hear us now, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son and our mediator and advocate. Amen. And so we hear these words. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you and have mercy on me and set us free from sin. Strengthen us in goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us continue to worship his name today knowing that we are forgiven. Hi friends, you find us in the stable once again, having our usual fun. Hi friends, hope you're staying safe. I'm going to make some Skittles today. I'm going to show you how to make one, but then you can get on with it yourself at home. Perhaps something for the holidays. I'm going to use this little milk bottle well, I have used it already. But you could use a yoghurt drinks bottle or tins and just put a bit of tape around the sharp edges. Hannah, why are you making Skittles? Well, Paul, in our Bible reading today, it talks about how the people Paul was talking to had lots of idols. Ooh, I know what they are. They're things that people worship. They can be stone statues that people bow down to and give presents to. That's right, Paul. But the thing is, idols don't need to be statues made out of stone. Sometimes today we can make people or things we have or things we do our idols. It's where we give them more worth than God, the God who we say we're following. So what has making Skittles got to do with all this then? I was thinking, if we made the Skittles and think about maybe some of the things that we might idolise, perhaps a person. Like a famous footballer. Or an item. Mm, like chocolate. Then we visualise the Skittle as that item and then when we throw a ball or a bean bag to knock down the Skittle, it's like us saying to God, we're sorry for the idols that we have and asking him to help us put him first. I'm going to pray for us using our Bible reading for today whilst you think or pray or even play. Thank you, God, that you made the world and everything in it. And it belongs to you, the Lord of heaven and earth. Thank you that you give everyone life and breath and everything else. Help us seek you first put you first and live for you first. Amen. In a few moments time, Liz is going to be speaking to us on our reading today. But before that, we're going to hear our reading today. And today, Beth Rees in South Wales, a member of our online church and community, also known as my mam, is going to be reading for us. 
Acts chapter 17 verse 16 onwards in Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting near the Agapus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Agapus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you were very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by hands, And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time was set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Diagnosis, a member of the Acapas, and a woman like Demurius, and a number of others. Hello, it is lovely to be with you again today. But before we get started, we uh, shall we just pray together? Oh, Father God, we we do thank you. We thank you for the gift of technology, which allows us to be together today. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you for the presence of your spirit here with us. Your spirit that unites us together by your love for us and who helps to guide us, encourage, challenge and equip us as we seek to serve you in the places and the context that you've called us to be. Amen. As we have made our way through the book of Acts, we have been consistently reminded by stories from the early church and from those first apostles of the importance of sharing our faith with others. And in today's reading, Paul once again gives us a class in uh, sharing our faith. But this time, Paul does it with a bit of a difference because today, Paul gives us some really helpful principles in sharing the gospel with people who have perhaps never really heard of Jesus or engaged with church before. And so the first thing we see Paul do in today's reading is that he engages with the local culture that he's in. 
Now, uh, Paul is in Athens and this is his first visit to Athens. Um, Athens has this big philosophical history uh, thanks to heavyweights such as Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and it has this reputation for being something of an intellectual metropolis, shall we say. Um, but this wouldn't have been an entirely alien culture for Paul. You know, he was from Tarsus, which was a centre for government and commerce. And, um, and well, Paul was a clever boy. You know, he was well educated and he was more than capable of standing toe to toe with the bigwigs of Athens. He was able to talk their language. He understood really who he was talking to. And that is never a bad place to start. Because when we understand who we're talking to, we can make our message much easier to hear. If we effectively want to share our faith with others, then we need to understand their local culture. We need to understand the communities of the people that we're trying to reach out to. The reality is that people who don't know Jesus are not just gonna come to church. Why would they? I literally, I literally only know of one person who ever came to church for the first time because they just woke up on Sunday morning and thought, you know what? I'm going to go to church today. As a general rule, things like that don't happen. And so if we want people to come to faith, if we want them to hear about Jesus, then we have to be intentional about the conversations that we have with them outside the church. And that means sharing the gospel in a slightly different way. You know, if, if I go to church, it is okay for me to get up and preach a sermon. Generally, it's expected. But that's not going to work, say, uh, I don't know, uh, if I go to a family party uh, where most of the people have no connection to church. You know, if I choose that moment to get up and preach a sermon, I think it's a pretty safe bet that no one would come to faith. In fact, I genuinely think that all that's likely to happen is that I would become that weirdo aunt that everybody just laughs awkwardly at, and then I become the person that no longer gets invited to family parties. If I want to share my faith at a family party, then I'm going to need to do it in a different way, in a way that's appropriate to the situation, and in a way that actually connects with the people that I'm talking to. And it's no different. It's no different for us in, in whatever situation we find ourselves in. If we want to share our faith with people in our community, then we need to do it in a way that connects with them and their situation, with them and their culture. And that means we've got to get to know them. If we want to share faith with people in a meaningful way, then we actually have to become part of their community. So Paul's in Athens and he is waiting for Timothy and Silas to arrive. And while he's waiting, we see that he's actively observing and learning about this community. And he notices that they've got this massive problem with idolatry. And uh, in some translations, it says Paul's spirit was provoked. And I love the idea that Paul's spirit was provoked because it kind of shows that this issue with idolatry isn't just something that he happened to notice in his humanness. It's a spiritual thing. It's God showing it to him. It's God saying, look, Paul, notice this and start here. And so when we look at our communities and the places that we want to reach out to, we have to start by saying, God, would you help us to notice things? Would you show us the places that you want us to start? But if we want to connect and reach out to our communities, we are going to need to venture outside of the church. And yes, Paul did go to the synagogue, but that's not where he's learning about the community. He's doing that outside, in the marketplace, among people. And I think that's such a big challenge for all of us, isn't it? For us as churches, you know, we have spent so much of our time over the years trying to attract people to come into church that we've missed the opportunity to take Jesus out into the community. Thanks to the wonders of Zoom, I was chatting to an American church planter recently and he came out with this brilliant line and I did tell him at that point that I was gonna rip it off as many times as I could. And uh, he said this, he said, the thing about mission 
is that it should never be about people getting, getting people into church. It should be getting people out of the church and into their communities. And that is such a challenge for all of us, isn't it? To ask ourselves, how am I going to get out there and connect with my community? To take seriously some time with God and to ask him to show me, show me where you want to start, show me where and who you want me to connect with. So Paul engages with the local culture. He uses this as a means to talk about Jesus. But it turns out that people, even when you engage with their culture, find that talking about Jesus is often a bit weird. And so the local people look at Paul when he's talking and they look at each other and they say, what is this babbler wanting to say? They don't understand. But because Paul had made himself one of them, they are still interested. They didn't get it, but they knew they wanted to know more. By engaging with the local community, Paul affords himself this opportunity to speak more openly and widely about his faith. And so they take him off to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus, it's a real place. It's, uh, it's known as Mars Hill. And it's essentially this mountaintop and it's made out of marble and it's where all the significant debates and trials took place. And essentially they take Paul there so that they can really listen to what he's got to say. And this is a sign that they are taking him seriously. And Paul grabs this opportunity with two hands and he begins to talk to them. And this, I think, is where we see Paul be quite un paul like Because before, when we've seen him share his faith, he's, he's done it by opening up and explaining scripture to people. But not this time. This time he engages in, for want of a different phrase, he engages in natural theology. Paul understands the community. He knows that if he starts with scripture, he is not going to get anywhere. He knows that these guys have got no real knowledge of scripture. And so if he launches straight into it, he's going to lose them straight away. And so instead, he talks to them about the things that are familiar and important to them. He starts with God's starting place of idolatry. I talked a few weeks about, uh, uh, back about us, the need for us to try to remove stumbling blocks that might be between us and other people hearing the gospel. And I think this is essentially what Paul is doing. You know, if he had talked about scripture, it would have been a stumbling block and they would have written off his babblings of those of us, as, you know, as a foolish old man. But by using the examples that they're familiar with, he gives them the best possible chance of being able to hear and respond to the gospel message. And so he picks God's starting point and he talks to them about their idols and about their altar to the unknown God. And he doesn't even dive straight in with, right, well, you've got that all wrong, you need to get rid of that. No, he uses it just to make this point that, you know, you guys are worshipping a God you don't even know. And then he uses it as a way to point them to the true God. Paul knows exactly what he wants to say to these guys, but he wants to say it in a way that they might really hear him. So he starts with a familiar starting point. And don't get me wrong, please don't get me wrong. I don't think for a, a second that Paul is suggesting that these guys are actually worshipping God and it's just that they didn't know his name. You know, they're not, they didn't somehow accidentally start to worship the true God. But he uses it as a way to challenge them, to pose that fundamental question of, well, who is God then? And similarly, you know, Paul, he goes on and he chooses not to quote, quote scripture. In verse 28, he quotes uh, words from what would have been uh, well-known philosophers and poets. Again, he's taking things that would have been familiar and he's using them as a way to frame the way he talks about God. He's essentially explaining God to them in a cultural way that makes what he's saying to them relevant and easier to understand and accept. And I think this is, this is so important for us today as we, as we kind of seek to truly become part of our communities. We have to ask ourselves, what might be the best way for us to share the gospel? 
What kind of ways might God already be present in these situations that I can simply tap into? I had, I had a lovely conversation with a couple this week. Um, they're not Christians, um, but we have a shared interest in psychology and stuff like that. And uh, we were talking and I realised that much of what they were talking about and thinking about were actually very spiritual ideas. And I'm not sure that they would have t- uh, framed it in terms of the Christian faith, but it gave me this opportunity to actually say, you know, this is how I would frame it, and this is how that might fit. And, and is this something you want to hear more about and explore? And the answer was yes, let's talk more. And you know, who knows? Who knows where those conversations will lead? But it all came from that starting point of a shared interest, of a, of a God-given opportunity for me to share within a context that was familiar to them. And it's exciting stuff, you know, I think. I think engaging with our culture and context is vital if we want to share Jesus in a way that's relevant to people. But it would be wrong of me, it would be wrong of me not to add just a little, little word of caution. But as Christians, we are also called to be countercultural. We're called to be in the world, not of the world. So there always has to be a difference between us and the rest of us and the rest of the world to actually find that opportunity to share. So for example, for example, as part of some research I once did, I was talking to people about their spiritual experiences. But of course, not all spirituality has Christian roots. You know, there is a, there's a difference between going outside and feeling spiritually connected to nature and feeling spiritually connected to the God who created that. And it's often these little points of difference that give us our opportunity to share. And so we do have to be careful. We have to make sure that we remain accountable and that we remain intentional about sharing the gospel. Otherwise, the message of Jesus is diminished and and you know we lose our ability to make a difference. You see, Paul, he engages with culture. He uses this kind of natural theology, but he never, ever compromises the gospel. Now, there are people who are far cleverer than me that would argue that Paul doesn't do a very good job here because he doesn't actually, if we look, explicitly talk all that much about Jesus. But let's have a little look very quickly about what he does say. He says, this is personal. In verse 29, he says, uh, God is so much more than all these idols that you've made out of stone and gold and silver. And he says, these things to a point are just made up, God. But God is real. God is in spirit and in truth. And he wants a relationship with you. He says, you need to repent. In verse 30, Paul says, he commands all people, everyone to repent. And you know, repentance is at the heart of the Christian faith. And so Paul says to them, you've got to repent. You've got to leave all those false gods and idols. And you've got to turn towards the one true God. He says, you didn't know about it before, but now, now you've heard about the true God. Now you've got to choose to repent if you want to follow him. And he says, this is important. This is important because Jesus is coming back. He clearly says to them, you've got to make a decision because one day, one day judgment will come and it will come at the hand of the one who has been appointed by God and whose hope we are assured of through his rising from the dead. Does Paul say everything there is to say about Jesus? No, of course he doesn't. But he doesn't compromise on the message. He speaks of the nature of God. He speaks for our, to our need for repentance and he looks for the time when Jesus will return. Now that's not bad for a first meeting, is it? But as the passage ends, we're reminded that this sharing our faith is not a one-stop shop. As the passage ends, we're told that some people mocked Paul, some people believed, and others said, and I love this, we will hear from you again about this. For some Paul, for some people, Paul had kind of wet their appetite, appetite, appetite. They were intrigued. They wanted, they were going to go away and think about it, but they wanted to come back for more. They wanted to have more conversations about this. 
And so often that's how life goes, isn't it? We can have a conversation with someone and then they go away and then they might come back and ask more questions or they might say something more about their reaction to what you said before. And just sort of slowly but surely these conversations of faith build. And it might take weeks or months or years, but they build because that person knows you're there and they know and they can see by the way that, they, by the way that you live your life. But those kind of relationships and those kind of conversations only happen when we're prepared to truly live among our communities to immerse ourselves in them, to understand the things that they love and the ways in which they hurt and the things that bring them pain and joy. And when we're prepared to feel all those things and to experience all those things with them, then we will afford ourselves the opportunity to talk to them about Jesus in a way that is relevant and in a way that is relatable and understandable and in a way that we pray would be truly life-changing for us and for them and for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Amen. There is one thing that we can all do, no matter who we are, how young we are, 
or how old we are, and that is pray. And pray is a powerful thing. Pray builds the kingdom of God. Pray breaks down barriers. When we pray, we know that we have the Lord with us. He is listening and he is on our side. And so right now, we are gonna go into a time of prayer. And it's gonna be led for us by Andrew and Anthea Filmer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the creator of all, the source of life and light. We exalt you. May your glory cover the earth. We bless you. Thank you that you sent us a saviour in Jesus to set us free to live for you. Thank you that in him we have forgiveness and life to the full. Heavenly Father, thank you for your creation, for its beauty and abundance. You made it and declared that it was very good, but we have not treated it or our fellow humans with the respect they and it deserve. We are sorry and ask that you help your church to care for creation and those who live in poverty. We pray especially for the current climate emergency that is creating increasingly extreme weather conditions around the world. Help us in the church to act. With less than 100 days to COP26 in Glasgow, we ask for wisdom for those leaders who will gather, for meaningful, ambitious action, and especially that the cries of the most vulnerable will be heard in those discussions. We pray for all those most vulnerable in the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, whether in our own nation or across the world. We pray for the effective distribution of vaccines to all part of, parts of the world, and for the church to be active in advocating for meaningful action to counter the inequality in access to good health care. We pray for the leadership of our nation, our nation Wales. We pray for wisdom as our leaders negotiate the complexities of leading this nation. And we pray that they will serve the nation free from the influence of vested interests. And finally, we pray for the leadership of our church, those who are ordained, but also those who serve on the church committee, uh, the wardens, those who lead the different ministries. Heavenly Father, we thank you for them and we ask that you bless them and strengthen them as they seek to walk faithfully in your service. Let's continue to pray. Dear Father, we turn our thoughts and prayers to our churches here in Aberystwyth. We pray for all the churches in our ministry area as they find new ways to teach people online. Lord, some wonderful things have come about through the online services and we thank you for these. Lord, we pray that you can help us to continue to meet together even when it's hard and tiring to be in front of screens. We thank you that we've been able to meet in our church buildings again, even with restrictions. We pray especially for the parents and toddlers group that has been able to meet again. We pray for the parents who come through the doors seeking companionship, help and community. And we pray also for the children who may not have had as many opportunities to socialise as they may have done pre-pandemic. Please work in the conversations and help Hannah and her team to know by your Holy Spirit the words and approach each parent is seeking. Lord, we pray for our town, especially as more people come here on holidays. Please calm any frustrations towards the restrictions. Please help people to be mindful of keeping our town clean as they are on holiday. We pray for the Jubilee Storehouse as they continue to provide for people who are anxious, in distress, about groceries. By your spirit, help us to live in peace with one another. Help us to lay aside our own concerns and to focus our attention on those who are vulnerable among us. We think now of our friends, family members and neighbours who are sick and lonely. Show us how to care for these people who we know who are anxious, fearful and sick. Strengthen those who are treating those we know who are sick and help us to comfort those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Help us to remember that by Jesus' death and resurrection, you have set us all free from the penalty of sin and the fear of death. Give us a firm trust in your goodness all the time and of the hope in your promises to us. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Savior, to fall on your grace. 
Father God, we give thanks for the freedom to worship your name and we give thanks that your spirit is resting upon us. And we pray now that as we come out of this time of worship, we will continue in our day and continue in our week in a spirit of praise and worship as we give you the thanks, as we give you the praise, as we give you the glory may we recognize you with us wherever we go. Amen. And so we have indeed come to the end of our service and can say a massive thank you as always for everyone who has taken part and all of us who have worshipped the name of the Lord together. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful that even though we have our scattered lives and even though we are separated by so much distance, we are united as one in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, bound together by the power of his Holy Spirit. And as we go into today, as we go into this week, know that that bond keeps us together. Indeed, if there is anything on your mind, anything that you want to talk about or anything you are going through, we would love to be there to help you and support you and to pray for you as well. So please feel free to give us a call or send us an email and know that we will be there for you. Together, holding each other up in the holy love of God, which does indeed, as I say, bind us together. 
You may have seen already via Facebook or even got an email that we are currently looking at this online church that we do. And a survey is out there so we can learn together and discern the way forward. Please, if you have the time and you haven't done so already, please take the time to fill in that survey. And on Facebook now, a link is going to appear below to show how you can do that. But above all, Let's go out this week telling the message of the Lord, speaking into the context that the Lord places us in and going out in his love and in the power of his name. So let's go with God's blessing. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us this day and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let's go out there. Let's have a great week. God is with us and nothing can stand in his way. Mm -hmm.